Okay, Sober, you're not gonna make any puns about Rare. It's low-hanging fruit and you're better than that. Here on Design Documentaries, we cover a wide variety of games. From the successes to the failures, ranging from the obscure cult classics to some of the most popular games. But this is the first time we've covered a game that would create such an impact that its echoes are still being heard over two decades later. GoldenEye 007 would not only set the standard for console first-person shooters, but would create a legacy that would survive over four console generations. No one knew that GoldenEye was going to be the success that it became. It was a movie license game in a time where they were notorious for poor quality. It wasn't a popular genre, especially on consoles. The game was a console exclusive. It nearly lacked the inclusion of its famous multiplayer, and almost wasn't released at all. And to top it all off, the development team responsible had never made a game before. It's rare when a game company had accidentally created one of the best games ever made. This is Design Documentaries, and today we're looking at the Nintendo 64 classic, Goldeneye, made by... Ro Wait a second. It's rare when a game... Aw, oh, dang it! It's been over 20 years since Rare released its critically acclaimed first-person shooter, GoldenEye 007, on August 25th, 1997. And let's just talk about a fraction of this game's legacy. It has sold over 8 million copies, selling more than Doom and Quake at the time, and initially selling more than Super Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, and coming dangerously close to overshadowing Final Fantasy VII that released that same year. It made over $250 million in sales, which easily doubled the $106 million domestic release of the movie it was based on. It received universal praise from critics and consumers, it won multiple awards the year it was released, and even to this day it's still a constant contender for one of the best games of all time. GoldenEye was so influential to what we now know as a first-person shooter that it's easy to forget just how many innovations it brought to the table. For example, in the era that GoldenEye released, the genre wasn't even called a first-person shooter, but was affectionately referred to as a Doom clone. This was because up until the late 90s, there were only a handful of first-person shooters available with Doom being one of the first ones to achieve widespread recognition. While the genre was just starting to gain traction on personal computers, outside of ports of Doom and a few games like Jumping Flash, the genre was pretty much unheard of on consoles. Even then, first-person shooters were often very similar. You'd shoot some enemies, then grab a keycard and find a better weapon to shoot more enemies, grab another key and shoot more enemies, make it to the end of the stage, then repeat. Valve's Half-Life wouldn't exist for another year, which meant no Counter-Strike either. And even though multiplayer was available in games like Doom or Quake, or even as far back as MIDI Maze, it wasn't even considered a selling point noted by its lack of inclusions in games like Doom 64 and Turok. GoldenEye had changed everything we knew about how Doom clones were designed. Levels had objectives that were simply more than kill every enemy in the room and make it to the end of the level. There was an overarching story that connected one scene to another. There was stealth, in the sense that enemies wouldn't be alerted to you if they couldn't see you. There were cameras that can sound an alarm if you weren't paying attention. 
You could take an enemy out with a shot in the head, or shoot them in a groin and laugh maniacally as they writhe in pain, or watch them go flying as you hit them with an explosive. You could shoot a grenade out of their hands or a hat off their head. You could precisely aim over civilians and hostages to take out their captors. I mean, there was a level you could get into a tank and run people over, and there was this morbid, satisfying scream and squish. <laughs> Goldeneye went from a Doom clone to something that stood entirely apart from its forebearer. I cannot emphasize enough just how far ahead Goldeneye was ahead of its time. And it's in no small part due to the company that developed it, Rareware. In fact, Goldeneye's success stems all the way back with the company's founding. Since the beginning, they had a standard for quality in their games that was considered rare among devel- SON OF A- Before we start though, let's clarify one thing. Rare wasn't a small, scrappy indie development company when they developed Goldeneye. They were already a household name among Nintendo fans. But their legacy goes back long before they're even known as Rare. Founded by Tim and Chris Stamper in 1982, the company was originally known as Ultimate Play the Game. Based in the United Kingdom, the pair started with arcade development before moving to create games for amazingly British sounding home computers like the BBC Micro and the ZX Spectrum. The brothers released several highly successful games like Lunar Jetman and Saber Wolf. Ultimate became known for its quality during a period when a flood of poorly made games had been responsible for the video game crash. This quality stemmed from Chris and Tim's grueling work ethic, the two only taking two days off in three years. They would often work 18 hour shifts because in their own words, we don't feel it's any good having engineers that only work 9 to 5 because you get a 9 to 5 game. They were so successful that the small and isolated British home computer market ended up proving itself too limiting for the ambitious brothers. Instead, they had their sights focused on a growing Japanese game market, more specifically with Nintendo's Famicom. Tim and Chris ultimately sold Ultimate Play the Game to another company, then spent several months reverse engineering the Famicom to produce several tech demos to show to Nintendo. Up until then, Nintendo didn't have much, if any, contact with Western development studios. But they were so impressed by the brothers that they not only gave them permission to work on their console, but also gave them what was effectively an unlimited budget and license to produce as many games as they wanted. During an era where Nintendo only allowed companies to produce five games a year, Though the Stamper Brothers had been using the Rare name just before they sold Ultimate, this was the true birth of Rare, as Nintendo's first third-party Western developer. And they took full advantage of the opportunity, creating and porting games nearly a full year before the NES would be released in the UK. They were the company behind Battletoads, Wizards and Warriors, RC Pro-Am, they pioneered innovative games like Who Framed Roger Rabbit with its GTA-style open world. That's not to say the game was any good. And were solely responsible for Nintendo's most popular tarot card simulator. The company kept growing well into the release of the Super Nintendo, but with the shift in console generations, Rare had changed focus to 3D graphic modeling due to the purchase of several Silicon Graphics workstations. Though the SNES wasn't capable of rendering these models through its hardware, Rare discovered that it could pre-render them as sprites then use them in a game, giving it a pseudo 3D look. Once again they had approached Nintendo with the concept, and once again Nintendo was highly impressed, purchasing so many shares in Rare that it became the majority stockholder and Nintendo's first second party developer. They gave Rare the license to Donkey Kong, and Rare used this newfound technology to create Donkey Kong Country, which would go on to become the Super Nintendo's third best-selling game. Rare had grown from a company formed by two brothers working out of a four-room row house, to eventually having over 250 employees. 
One of these employees was GoldenEye's director, Martin Hollis, who had joined Rare as a programmer for the arcade version of Killer Instinct. According to Hollis, Nintendo would approach Rare about possible game concepts, including the one using the Bond license, possibly as a side-scrolling platformer due to the success of Donkey Kong Country. Mark Betteridge, a designer at Rare, said that when Nintendo had asked Rare if they were interested in the project, the team's response was, well, not really. That's when Martin Hollis proposed to Tim Stamper about giving him a small team, pitching the project as a 3D shooter for Nintendo's upcoming console, the Ultra 64. Tim agreed and GoldenEye started development in March of 1995. Martin was given a small development team and a studio. Well, sort of. Ken Lobb, who was employed at Nintendo at the time and worked closely with the team throughout its development, called Rare's workplace the Manor Farmhouse. GoldenEye was developed in a repurposed barn. Rare's story, while certainly unique, wasn't all that uncommon in the early days of game development. But it's unimaginable to think one of the defining games of a generation was developed in a barn. And even more unlikely that if it wasn't for the ambition of a young programmer, the game might not have existed at all. So how did such a small team manage to accomplish the unthinkable? The answer to that is just as rare, um, just as, uh, hold on a moment, uh. One of the main reasons that Goldeneye was so different than any other Doom clone was due to the fact it wasn't initially designed as a first person shooter. As evidence, you don't have to look much farther than Goldeneye's design document. And it's hard to believe I've nearly gone 17 videos and I'm just now talking about the show's namesake. Design documents are what many software developers use to explain specifically how they're going to design their game. It often details a wide variety of things, anywhere from the gameplay mechanics, levels, different weapons, goals, basically anything that can be used as a reference for the rest of the development team, just to make sure that the end product shares the same vision. Though as projects continue, they can deviate from the original design quite a bit. GoldenEye's design document, for example, makes several references to Sega's Virtua Cop. Many make the assumption that this meant GoldenEye was going to be an unreal shooter, but according to the game's director Martin Hollis, he had the concept of making GoldenEye a first-person shooter since the beginning. In his own words, So yes, for the first few months, GoldenEye was partly envisioned as a simple unreal shooter only with no light gun, but I also wanted it to be a FPS. Yes, there was some vagueness here. You have to understand, we didn't know what the control of the N64 would be like, so it made designing a control system difficult at such an early stage. This led the team to having both as available options during development, only choosing to go full movement after they became more aware of what the Nintendo 64 was capable of. You can easily say that the development of the game got derailed. The inspiration from Virtua Cop lived on in many other aspects though. Being able to target certain body parts, for example, was lifted from Virtua Cop's mercy shots, and so was the inclusions of civilians and other various destructible environments. The ability to manually aim as well as zoom in on the target was something that was also distinctly pulled from Sega's light gun game. Yet the teams went above and beyond the Call of Duty and included innovative features for the time, such as the ability to surprise enemies and have them react to situations in fairly realistic ways, such as running for alarms or setting up ambush spots. It wasn't just Virtua Cop that GoldenEye borrowed from either, as they pulled inspiration from Nintendo's Super Mario 64 as well. Mario 64 had a fairly unique concept of having large open levels that featured several objectives that you could complete. GoldenEye borrowed heavily from that design, but instead had multiple objectives that you would have to accomplish during each level. An interesting thing to note that these levels were often designed before they had even thought of the missions themselves. 
They would attempt to find places to put the objectives, guards, and find use for the game's many gadgets. This is typically the opposite of what you should do, as it leaves certain parts of the game not used at all. Martin himself admits that this was a form of backwards game design born out of inexperience. And the truth is, the majority of Martin's team had never worked on a game before. Martin Hollis, himself only having worked on Killer Instinct, was joined by Mark Edmund, B. Jones, and Carl Hilton, none of which who have worked on a game before GoldenEye. As the project continued, they added David Doak, Steve Ellis, Duncan Botwood, composers Grant Kirkhope and Graham Norgate, and a few others to the development team, and almost none of them had experience either. The rest of the company, including founder Tim Stamper, had the impression that the team was a bunch of students wasting time. On the surface, it seems like GoldenEye's success was relying on the vast archive of games it borrowed from. Whether these newcomers had a facility for great game design, or just a lack of control can be debated. As technology, or at least their understanding of it, improved, the team was able to train their skills, and GoldenEye became a runway hit. Yet there are plenty of original games that were stuck in their own silo. So how exactly did GoldenEye stack up against other games in a library? And how did they manage not to cave in under pressure from the others? While it seems all very complex, the end result was something that ended up being a rare gen- DAMN! Almost ironically, it ended up being this inexperience that made GoldenEye so good. That's not to say experience isn't important, I mean, my tagline is, gaining experience builds character after all, but with experience can come complacency. Game design is about answering questions and solving problems, and having experience can give you a breadth of knowledge to pull from. However, there's often a tendency to take the path of least resistance, and to use designs and concepts that are proven. Great game designers can have a wide variety of solutions, and pick the one that fits best, but it's still using what other people have used. It takes a lot of effort to fight that inertia in order to create something original. Not to mention riskier, as audiences often prefer something more familiar. Inexperience often means you don't have preconceived concepts to pull from. While GoldenEye borrowed heavily from concepts in other games, it implemented them in a way that was wholly unique. Up until that point, no one knew exactly what a headshot would do, so the team would have to work to come up with a solution. That inexperience also meant the team didn't really have a concept of scope. They would often think of a concept they wanted to implement, then try to make it work as opposed to being forced to drop it for an easier, alternative method. A majority of the ideas they didn't even know they could implement since they didn't have access to the console's hardware until a year into development. David Doak, the game's writer, had said, If there had been any kind of sensible control, it probably wouldn't have been allowed to be as ambitious as it was. Which brings up another point that possibly contributed to GoldenEye's success. Creative freedom. GoldenEye was originally meant to be a tie-in with the film which released in November 1995. And, as a reminder, development started in March of 1995. By the time the first deadline had arrived, the game's engine wasn't even complete. Instead of pulling the plug on the project, Rare instead have given more time and staff. The game kept being delayed and was constantly in a buggy state, but Rare had kept allowing them to work on it at their own pace. By the time GoldenEye would release, the next Bond movie, Tomorrow Never Dies, had already finished filming. In addition, the team kept running up against other parties during development. According to Doak, MGM Studios had come into the offices at some point and had asked the game to reduce the amount of violence in it. Ironically, based on the same movie in which Bond scored his highest body count. However, they weren't alone because even Shigeru Miyamoto had stopped in to see how development was going and was uncomfortable with the amount of violence in the game. 
He sent a fact stating that he felt the game was too tragic. And at the end of the game, you should get to shake hands with all your enemies in the hospital. This humorous anecdote is what led Martin to include the casting credits at the end of the game. To reaffirm the movie setting, but nothing was censored content-wise. All of that may or may not have had anything to do with Nintendo, the game's publisher, eventually pulling support from the project. There were accounts from Mark Betteridge that Nintendo actually told Rare to cancel the project. Grant Kirkhope, one of the game's composers, gave his own account. I mean, like, I know Nintendo stopped funding Golden after a while because they didn't want it. They it, was just, it was just crap and it was just taking too long to make. Sure. But, but the, the, the Rare didn't tell us that, they just kept paying us to do it. Wow. It wasn't due to Rare having much faith in the project's success either. After a lackluster showing at E3 1997, longtime Rare designer Greg Mills claimed to have stated, It's a bit of a mess, and thank god we got Banjo. Referring to another game that Rare was releasing, Banjo Kazooie. Seriously, I'm pulling back to a live shot just so you can physically see how impressed I am with Rare as a company for that decision. They were told by multiple parties to change the game. They were told by the publisher to cancel the game. They were even paying the team out of their own pocket for a project they didn't think was going to be successful. That kind of integrity among developers is incredibly rare. <sighs> Perhaps the reason Rare had supported the team was due to their dedication and passion for the project. Martin and his team were often working anywhere from 80 to 120 hour work weeks, which was very reminiscent of founders Chris and Tim Stamper's work ethic. Or maybe Rare realized the team, regardless of their experiences, had a lot of talent. Again, the team was developing a game for a console that hardly anyone was familiar with, one that was notoriously difficult to develop for, and they didn't even have access to the development kit for the first year. Yet near the end of development, one of the programmers, Steve Ellis, had added the entire multiplayer mode to the game, mostly by himself. That's right, one of the features that contributed to the success of Goldeneye wasn't even intended to be there at all. The team had added it last minute with neither permission from Nintendo or Rare because they thought it would be a good idea, and they managed to do it so late in production that neither company could have them remove it. At least, that's what's been said. There is a different account from Ken Lobb who claims that he had encouraged the team to add multiplayer since the inception. Regardless of which account is true, there's no doubt the team knew a lot about the hardware and maybe Rare thought it might have been a good experience for the new team. Or maybe Rare just liked a good scrappy indie development story and wanted to see it play out. Whatever the reason, the decision paid off. Goldeneye released and managed to be a major success for the company. And geez, I realized I've been talking this long and I haven't even started to get into the gameplay. But honestly, do I even need to? Come on, it's Goldeneye. While the game definitely shows signs of its age, it barely runs at 15 frames per second, and it plays on a controller that's more polarizing than practical, at the end of the day it's still freaking Goldeneye. During the time of its release, the game was nothing short of revolutionary. But even today, you can feel the amount of love and care that the developers put into it. That distinct feeling of unloading a clip as you strafe past a corridor. Seeing those tracer rounds fly by as you take cover to reload. That very distinct, crisp sound of the Davastai as you fire just feels... <laughs> satisfying. How nearly every object in a game creates an explosion when destroyed, making firefights needlessly more intense. That sensation of taking out a guard through manual aim who doesn't notice you spying on him through a window. That tension you feel when you have a multiplayer license to kill slappers only fight, trying to navigate a dance of vague hitboxes and precise movement. I mean, I'll be honest, it's hard to tell exactly where game design ends and nostalgia begins. Was Goldeneye the perfect game? Uh, not by any means. Even comparing it to its own era, it still had several issues between frame rates and fog. 
But I'd argue that despite its age, the fact that an early 3D shooter can still be as fun speaks volumes about its quality. And since then, nearly every first-person shooter has utilized something that GoldenEye had pioneered. While it's an exaggeration to state that these innovations would have never came about without GoldenEye, Rare's success with the genre had brought the idea of a console first-person shooter to the mainstream. And without it, who knows what the landscape of FPS's might have been. And while there's certainly been more successful first-person shooters released since then, there hasn't been one that's been able to create the same legacy for itself. And it's not been for a lack of trying. First-person shooters certainly aren't as rare as they used to- CARDS! I... I mean, uh, look at all these rare cards I have. After GoldenEye's success, Rare had considered working on a sequel based on Tomorrow Never Dies. However, Electronic Arts had purchased the rights to the Bond license by outbidding Rare and released their movie tie-in on the PlayStation. It was a solid... meh, according to critics. The sequel to that, The World Is Not Enough, ended up being better received, but again, it was difficult to compare it to GoldenEye. As far as I can tell, there hasn't been a James Bond licensed title that would even come close to the popularity. Meanwhile, Rare was doing its own thing with its spiritual successor, Perfect Dark. It was Martin Hollis and his team, armed with not only the same engine, but now with the experience and confidence as proven game developers. It was going to be bigger and better. The team tripled in size. Perfect Dark was the sequel that everyone wanted. And then it was delayed. Then delayed again, and delayed again. Perfect Dark was a project that took over three years. It wouldn't be released until May 22, 2000. However, development was so strained that Martin Hollis decided to leave within 14 months of the game's production, and it wasn't much longer that others had followed suit. Perfect Dark was successful and critically praised as a better game in the sense of graphics, design, and a multitude of multiplayer options, but still didn't see nearly as much success as GoldenEye. Years later, Electronic Arts had attempted to cash in on its success by creating GoldenEye Rogue Agent, except it didn't have anything to do with GoldenEye. The game is literally named after a rogue MI6 agent who has a golden eye. Seriously, this has got to be the first attempt of a clickbait game. That wouldn't be the only attempt to bring the MI6 hero back from the dead. In 2006, Reggie fils took a break from crushing our spirits about Mother 3 in order to tease us about a virtual console release of GoldenEye. According to Reggie, we would love to see GoldenEye on virtual consoles, so we're exploring all the rights issues. But, as you can probably assume, that never came to fruition. However, it was around that time an HD remake of GoldenEye was rumored to be in works for a release on Xbox Live Arcade, being developed by Rare alongside the rights holder Activision. The rumor first broke in 2007 when an anonymous employee of Rare, going by the name of Oddjaw2, had made a post detailing information about the game including a screenshot as evidence. He claimed that Nintendo, at the last minute, had blocked it even though they had no rights to do so, and urged form users to contact them and tell them to reconsider. There was initial doubt to the validity of these claims, but as others looked into it, they found grains of truth. It was even said that Satoru Awada, president of Nintendo, had personally blocked the decision not wanting GoldenEye to be released on any other console other than Nintendo. And that was apparently enough to fully stop the game from ever finishing development and being released. Activision though, not one to let an opportunity to make money slip out of their hands and possibly fueled by spite, had other plans. In 2010, they released a trailer with these famous words. Let's say that after 13 years of gaming innovation, a new GoldenEye game is coming up. Oh yeah. my god! Yes. Was this the remake we've been waiting for? Was this the GoldenEye that we- Yeah, I'm not even gonna try to pretend at this point. 
Though the Wii release was considered to be above average by critics, later releases for GoldenEye 007 Reloaded were considered mixed at best. It appears that not even GoldenEye can outdo GoldenEye. Yet GoldenEye still manages to live on, mainly due to its devoted fan base. There are still a bunch of fan projects out there, one of the longest running ones being GoldenEye Source, which started all the way back in 2005 and it's still being updated to this day. Meanwhile, there are projects like GoldenEye X, a full conversion of GoldenEye using the perfect Dark Engine. So if you ever wanted a multiplayer GoldenEye with bot support, there you go. The game continues to be popular with speedrunners, and there are developers out there who 20 years later are still being inspired by the same passion and dedication of the original team. So what happened with the team anyway? Well, Steve Ellis, David Doak, and Carl Hilton had left Rare during the production of Perfect Dark to found Free Radical Design, which would go on to make Time Splitters and Second Sight. However, Free Radical was forced to close in 2008, after an issue of publishing Star Wars Battlefront 3 and poor sales of their latest game, Haze. Steve Ellis would found Crash Lab after his departure from Free Radical, David Dr. Doak became a lecturer for game art and design at Norwich University of the Arts. And Carl Hilton is now head of a development studio, Sumo Digital. Duncan Botwood left Rare in 2008 to eventually join Ubisoft Toronto. Mark Edmonds also left Rare in 2008 to join Starfire Studios. Composer Graham Norgate became the audio director at Deep Silver. Grant Kirkhope continues to produce music, most notably for his involvement with ukulele. Artist B. Jones now works at Jellyfish Studios. And Martin Hollis, lead director for GoldenEye, is an independent game developer. And while he isn't making the next GoldenEye, he is still doing something he loves. It's kind of funny that a game made by a team of inexperienced individuals would go on to create so many experiences for others. That's something that doesn't happen often. In fact, you can even say it was... infrequent. The name's Dwarf. Sober Dwarf. Reminding you that sometimes inexperience builds character. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, feel free to share it with your old multiplayer friends, and maybe get together for some License to Kill Slappers Only action for yourselves. But before you do that, remember to like and subscribe, and leave your own memories of GoldenEye in the comments. And check out some of my other design documentaries, including another game made by Rare, Taboo, The Sixth Sense. If you really want to support the show, check out my Patreon. Any amount helps me continue to make highly produced videos like this one. And you can get some pretty cool things like your name here with all these awesome people that make the show possible. Or if you're interested in a one-time donation, you can check out my coffee account in the description below. Until next time, this is Soberdorf reminding you that gaining experience builds character.